Uh, thank you everyone for joining this plenary. Um, I will be co-sharing the session with Nina. We not given that we only have 30 minutes, we won't be uh, going through uh, lengthy introductions. Um, there is a uh, the program with all of our uh, details. Uh, sufficient to say that we are honored by our panel members, uh, given that they have been working on this agenda in their own right uh, and contributing significantly to progressing uh, a climate conscious lawyer, lawyering. That will be the focus of today, how bar associations and law societies can strengthen the practice of uh, climate conscious lawyering. Now, I, I must say that arguably as a professional service sector, the legal sector has been the slowest to come to the table in regards to its uh, responsibility and contribution to uh, accelerating the transition. Nevertheless, we are probably of the professional services, some of, or perhaps the most instrumental in, in accelerating it. So I am really, really pleased that we finally have um, not just this panel, but we've had previous conversations today and yesterday on, on, on this precise topic. Um, the conversation today will be structured around three questions, mainly the opportunities of bar associations and law societies, the limits and challenges of uh, law societies and associations in, in furthering this, this agenda, and the practical implementations for, for such. Um, with that, I will turn to my first speaker, which is Estelle. Estelle, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephen, Nina, thank you very much indeed, um, and I'm very pleased to be participating today. Uh, I come to this um, as a, a practicing barrister um, in South Africa and the United Kingdom, but also as a co-chair of the um, England and Wales Bar Council's Climate Crisis Working Group, and we've been thinking a lot about what uh, law societies and bar councils can do to address the climate crisis. One of the key areas, and this has uh, arisen across the discussion today uh, is what influence can be had about the ethical obligations or the rules of conduct that apply uh, to, to lawyers, either as solicitors or um, attorneys or as advocates or uh, barristers. And uh, let me say four things about that in my four minutes. Um, first, I think it is absolutely in um, the wheel arch of law societies um, and bar councils, law associations in general, to give guidance on their, the ethical obligations that apply to their members and or to take decisions, maybe in the future in a kind of ratcheting way about whether the, um, the rules of conduct themselves uh, need to be uh, amended and strengthened. Uh, the rules of conduct that we have at the moment, though, are plainly going to be influenced by the climate crisis. And that's another thing that's come out across today, is that no matter what area of practice a lawyer finds themselves in, there will inevitably be an impact from the climate crisis. And you will find yourself advising your clients on, client risk, on, on climate risk and having to upskill yourself in relation to climate. So what then are the three difficulties that we've identified in looking at the ethical element of practicing law in a climate emergency? And there are three. The first is that some lawyers believe that climate conscious practice means that you do not work for or represent um, fossil fuel companies in particular uh, or greenhouse gas emitting uh, organizations in general. Other lawyers say that that is exactly where climate conscious lawyering is most needed. And so when one is looking at the ethical guidance or at um, what law, law associations can do, one has to think very carefully about the question about whether lawyers should be withdrawing their services from clients or whether they should not be withdrawing their services from clients, um, whether they should be shaping what they say to clients and possibly delivering a message that might be difficult for clients to hear, but their overarching obligation is to the court and to make sure that their clients understand risks properly. 
For barristers in particular and advocates in certain countries, there's an extra dimension to that difficulty because there's a rule called the cab rank rule, which requires you to take a case that is um, within your area of capacity um, and that you have time to do regardless of who it is, who your client is. And that is, um, looked at in quite an important way as an element of the rule of law and to protect lawyers from the sort of political interference that they might otherwise have. And so giving up that or in somehow amending that for the climate for reasons of climate um, is something that needs to be thought about carefully. Second, um, the question is whether climate is something different from other areas of work. So is the climate crisis because it is an existential threat, something that is sui generis, and very different and therefore requiring a different approach? Or is climate like uh, areas of equality and discrimination or like other areas, something that we can simply use a method that we've used for our rules and guidance before and apply it in the context of the climate. And that's something we need to deal with. And then the third one, uh, is that guidance should be in the way that it is in many other areas, especially commercial areas, to undertake your practice in a way that is compliant with 1.5 degrees of warming. But in other areas, there are established metrics in order to understand what that might mean, or there are metrics that are being put in place. And for lawyers, I think it's a key difficulty to understand for the different areas of practice what exactly that means in day to day, having a 1.5 degree compliant practice. So those are the three areas of difficulty. But my overarching point is, there is a lot that law societies and bar associations can do. And I'm very pleased that that work is being undertaken both in England and Wales and in other jurisdictions. Thank you so much, Estelle. Wendy gave me the honor in a session earlier this morning of, of putting me in, in your chambers. And I, I joked that they wouldn't have me uh, because they have such incredible talent as you, Estelle. That was um, a complete tour de force summary of, of really the, the groundwork of the difficulty here um, and the discussions that are being had. I'm gonna follow that up before I introduce our next unbelievably um, uh, impressive uh, speaker, Lungasani. Um, uh, just to kind of set the, the context um, uh, a bit more broadly and situate us um, where we are. So, and just the task, the massive task in front of everybody. Uh, Mark Carney said last year that the world's economy needs to be rewired. And lest we get too full of ourselves, lawyers are effectively the economy's janitors. Um, so we as practitioners should acknowledge um, our role in uh, minimizing disruption from this transition, but not um, uh, minimize the role of the massive, massive task in front of us. Um, I fully endorse, as I would, never would Estelle, um, uh, what you've just said, and also what Lara said, um, Lara Duvartsidis from the International Bar Association earlier. So there are these, these debates, but fundamentally practitioners have no role and cannot judge our clients. It's, it's fundamentally not our place. Uh, we have to advise, just as you said, Estelle, based on the law, based on the evidence. Um, and we do have to be quite careful in this space um, because of the, the risks of, of going too far, either alienating um, uh, what, you know, um, alienating others and undermining the it, crucial work that we're doing. We need to take action now and, and get everybody on board. Um, and there's also a risk that if lawyers started refusing work, there's a there would be um, a sort of legal arbitrage and even greater disruption because, of course, those players won't go without legal rep representation. They won't be represented um, by those who are properly advising them on the context um, and that transition and those the transition and the risks that that gives rise to. So we really do need to focus on making sure everyone gets competent legal advice, everyone understands the context in which they're giving that advice, um, and we do what we can as lawyers to um, strengthen that capacity, build that capacity and work together um, because the task is urgent, the task is huge um, and uh, we as lawyers here getting together um, are well placed to figure out what to do. So with that um, massive, massive challenge, Lugasari, as president of the Law Association of Zambia, senior counsel to the Bank of Zambia, lecturer uh, at the university in Zambia, I um, do, hopefully everyone can hear me, I'm getting a warning about my internet. Uh, I am in charm and um, uh, so needs must, I'm afraid I don't have an alternative. So hopefully um, you've, you haven't missed any of 
um, uh, any of that intro. Um, I'm going to just ask the question now, um, just in case I drop out again. Uh, Lungasani, what are the opportunities for the legal profession um, that you see in terms of this, this necessary rewiring work to implement the climate change agenda? Um, and if I can be greedy and ask a second question, I appreciate you, you took over from your predecessor um, this summer, but if you can, can you also reflect on the practical, um, because we are practitioners and, and we care about practical steps, what are the practical steps that bar associations can, in particular, can take? Um, because now, of course, is the time for action. Over to you, Lungasani. Thank you, Nina, and uh, 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 good to be here. Uh, Thank you. I, I think um, the, uh, let me begin with um, observation made by Steve that um, the, the, in as much as the legal profession is the slowest in terms of uh, coming on board to the climate agenda, I think it is the legal profession that possesses the most uh, potence to um, escalate the conversations and um, um, the initiatives to bring about uh, uh, all the climate change, change um, um, targets that are anticipated by the uh, regulatory framework around climate change. Why do I say so? The beginning point is that the instruments that are anticipated to be utilized to advance the climate agenda are within the fourth day or the mainstay of the legal profession. We need to use laws, we need to use policies, we need to use strategic uh, litigation all these are within the, uh, within the uh, skill sets and purview of the legal profession. So speaking from the bar perspective, I want to highlight five areas I see as potential areas which legal practitioners uh, can contribute to the discourse uh, on climate agenda. One, it's in the area of uh, drafting laws and policies. Um, lawyers are trained and have unique skill sets to draft laws and to draft policies. So I see a very critical you know, tool that lawyers can use to draft and reform laws that speak to climate change within the different countries and nations in which they would operate once. Secondly, it is in the area of strategic litigation the latest report on um, uh, strategic uh, global trends in strategic litigation on climate change does report that um, there's been an escalation of cases in the last uh, uh, two years or so. Um, between 20, 1996 to 2014, we had just under 800 cases, but uh, all of a sudden, uh, we are already over 2,000 cases from 2014 and between 2020 and 2022, the number increases. What this tells you is that strategic litigation is an important tool to change and, um, the mindsets of the public, as well as to enforce regulatory compliances related to climate change. And lawyers are the primary drivers of strategic litigation. The third area is um, the mere fact that uh, lawyers are leaders in society their opinion makers. So conscientizing the public on climate change uh, related topics is, is a very important uh, area that I believe the legal profession must take seriously. Fourthly is uh, I think um, um, Esther spoke to it about being a, a, um, a responsible practitioner, a global uh, responsible uh, citizen that is conscious in your practice uh, as you are you know, practicing as a lawyer. How do you ensure that your practice at a personal level is consistent with the issues of um, how much um, green gas you emit to the public, uh, to the uh, atmosphere? So there's also a private arm that uh, we need to look at. And finally, it is in the business support, um, finance sector and the other businesses that are trying to adapt their processes to the uh, climate change agenda are looking increasingly to professionals in the legal profession to support them how to adapt their businesses to be more uh, tuned to climate change, uh, change agenda. Now, these five areas are potential opportunities for us as a legal profession to contribute uh, effectively to the climate uh, change agenda. Now, once a bar or a law society identifies these opportunities, 
it then becomes easier to then build in specific mechanisms to capacitate each and every area for you know, better results. And capacity building, one of the issues I see as a challenge is you know, the upskilling knowledge so that we raise the awareness of the legal profession about the importance of climate change, firstly, but also how they can contribute in the different areas that are vitamized. Once we are specific and we capacitate the legal profession deliberately, we improve, I think, the impact that the legal profession will have in the climate uh, agenda. I personally believe that um, our, you know, our prospects of, uh, you know, uh, escalating the climate agenda globally is um, directly proportional to the uh, uptake and to the seriousness that the legal profession will give uh, to this uh, important existential issue. Ultimately, all lawyers are built to be of relevance in the society in which they operate. We ordinarily swear to utilize the law to the best of our ability for the advancement of society. There's been no better opportunity than now when society is facing a serious existential problem of climate change for us to step forward. But to step forward, of course, we must have uh, deliberate policies that acknowledge the challenges that are existing in the information and uh, you know, uh, skill sets and uh, knowledge around this area and the different areas we can contribute. Speaking for my bar here, uh, just um, uh, uh, three months ago, we were having our law conference. And uh, one of the issues we're trying to do is to you know, deliberately uh, create topics around continuous professional development that exposes the legal profession to these important uh, topics. So we had topics on ESG uh, and incidentally also in the, uh, in the country, we had elections last year and um, green economy and uh, environment is one of the uh, ministries that has been introduced. So the legal profession has increasingly been looking for ways to support government to you know, uh, drive the green economy agenda. So I thought I should just reflect on some of these uh, uh, areas, opportunities that exist. But of course, uh, the, there is lots of work that needs to be done to raise the awareness and indeed just appreciation by the legal profession itself that it can do much more and it has the capacity to do much more. I thank you, Nina. Absolutely. Thank you very much for outlining those five areas. And I could not agree more with the need for, for awareness and, and capacity building within the legal profession. I don't know on this school how many are aware that on the London Stock Exchange right now, the implied global warming potential is 3.5 degrees. And in a scenario of three degrees by 2100, 2100, Three degree scenario means that 75%, 75% of the global population, global population will be displaced. I don't know if uh, the rule of law will be able to be upheld in that scenario. The time for action is yesterday and it's really urgent. John does not need an introduction. He has been uh, involved in this conversation a long time and was also uh, chairing and, and facilitating uh, a parallel discussion yesterday, I believe. John, over to you, please. Well, thank you, Stephen and Nina, and uh, thank you to, to the organizers of this, including Marie Claire. Uh, I, I should say it's, it's worth noting that this is the first time, uh, certainly to my knowledge, and I'm pretty sure this is, this is right, we've never had bar associations or law associations uh, represented in this way. And we have not at a prior COP ever, I think, talked about the role of law associations uh, uh, in, in, in addressing climate change. And so I think a starting point here is just to note the moment and how singular this really is. Uh, Steve's point about uh, the, bar so the, the bar associations being uh, sort of the last of the game and some of the most important players uh, which uh, uh, was 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 echoed by by, by Lungusani, Lungusani um, is is spot on. I think um, opportunities. Bar associations are vehicles for representing all lawyers, and we're going to need all lawyers to to address climate change. And John Kerry told the American Bar Association, which I'm representing here. 
about a year ago, we are all climate lawyers now. And I think several different people have made that point that it's not a specialty. Climate law is not a specialty anymore. It's, it's going to be something that's going to affect every practice area, not just energy and environment, but, but, but insurance, commercial, property law, and, 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 and all of the rest. Um, law associations actually have a lot of members. There's a lot of people that they represent, and they represent them represent all these different lawyers um, in, a, in a, the leadership is the resolutions and decisions they make represent the considered judgment of, 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 of leaders uh, across, across society about what needs to be done with respect to climate change. And I think the change theory that we're all working from is that if you can change lawyers and what lawyers do, um, you, can, you can begin to change the world. I wouldn't uh, I would say it's the only lever, um, but it's it's an underappreciated lever. And I think given the different comments that people have made before, there's a huge place for opportunity here. The challenge, I think, to summarize it very quickly is what exactly do we, what guidance do we give lawyers across a wide range of practices, across a wide range of knowledge and expertise about climate change on what best practices actually are. If we assert, and we've all been more or less asserting that business as usual won't work anymore, that you can't say, oh, did you hear what uh, uh, Steve Gray had to say about how many refugees there's going to be and how unlivable the planet is going to be? And and oh, by the way, who's who's you know who's my team playing tonight? You put those two sentences together, and you capture a lot of the way we've been addressing climate change, which is a kind of a twilight zone aspect. To things are really bad, but we're not we're we're not going to change what we're doing. And the question is exactly how do you change? And, and for a particular lawyer, whether that lawyer is in Lusaka or San Antonio or Edinburgh, what exactly? is that lawyer supposed to do differently? And what kind of guidance can the Bar Association or the Law Society give that particular lawyer about what to do differently? I think that's really the biggest challenge. Um, I, could, I could say quite a lot more about that, but I, I think I'll just leave you with that point that, that we really need to think hard um, about what, ex if you'd say the Law Associations are coming together, what exactly, can, can the law associations do to move practitioners away from business as usual and towards something that addresses climate change in a serious way without, um, without losing credibility with the public where they are right now? I think that's the biggest challenge. Nina, were you, um, over to you, Nina. Thank you so much, Stephen. There was always somebody who's a bit slow to the off mute mic. Um, we have the benefit of the chair of the bar of England and Wales um, uh, in attendance virtually today, Mark Fennell's uh, Casey. I, I can't get used to that still. Um, Mark, could you please um, discuss, I know you've been um, uh, watching Estelle and uh, Ben Cooper, Casey, who's also listening. Um, welcome, Ben. Um, you've been watching their work, um, presumably with some interest, and having heard you know, from Estelle where she sees the tensions and, and from John on, um, and Dunzani on, um, you know, the practical steps that we can take as, as practitioners, sure. but also um, in the international and, and domestic context differences. Where, where do you see um, the bar in particular and, and the legal profession, if, if you feel um, you have something to say on that in this role. Nina, thank you. I'm, I'm assuming I'm on screen now. You are, yes, indeed, Mark. Splendid, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Can I thank all of you who've contributed to such an extraordinary two days and for all of your work, it's a real honour. I hadn't realised that no law associations or bar associations have been together at COP before, and so I'm delighted to serendipitously be part of this. Thank you all. Uh, I think the short answer to your question is three things. Firstly, bar associations, law associations can do as we did at the beginning of last year and launch the sort of internal looking advisory schemes that help lawyers deal with their own carbon position. You know, we call it a sustainability network for the barristers of England and Wales. That's the first thing you can do. 
The second thing you can do is you can look after those lawyers in countries around the world who are on the front line. In Britain, the front line, the tension between politics and law is often immigration. And it's immigration lawyers who get attacked in the press and sometimes physically. But in many countries around the world, as soon as you stand up to say that minerals should only be extracted in a reasonable way without damaging the environment, you become an enemy of the state. And I think national and international bar associations have a critical role to play to stand up for the rights of those lawyers who are simply doing the right thing. Third thing we've all got to do is to educate, to signpost, and to help inform lawyers who probably don't realize that these issues bleed into every area of their um, practice. I hadn't thought about it until I was sitting on the plane, sitting next to somebody, it wasn't the usual, usual easy jet crowd, talking about remuneration and employment contracts. How many labor lawyers have really thought through what the remuneration systems are like within companies that might have an impact on making, uh, on the climate issue. And so it's really getting people to open their eyes and think, which is the third great thing that we can do. But without, through all of that, um, I mean, there have been people who somewhat controversially said, we shouldn't act for people, we shouldn't do this, we shouldn't do that. I'm afraid that's quite wrong, in my judgment. We've got to keep remembering that principle 18 of the UN basic principles on the rule of lawyers, 1990, still holds good. Lawyers shall not be identified with their clients or their clients' causes as a result of discharging their functions. We see that throughout every area of tension and difficulty where law is involved, whether it be sanctions, crime, climate, all of these things. We've got a role to play and we must play it properly, but um, we can't start being campaigners, just campaigners, because then we, um, we don't have the protection that our professional role and responsibilities afford us. It's a bit of a longer answer than I was expecting to give Nina, but I don't want to trespass on the ex no, oh, thank you so much, Stephen. I'm so sorry I'm jumping in here. It's it's your turn to, to get the room, but I just wanted to say thank you so much, um, Mark, for your time and, and that invaluable contribution, and of course your articulate um, summary of, of where we are and where the boundaries ought to lie. Hmm. I don't know if I have a little opportunity just to say something extra on that, um, which is that it, obviously that's a, a a viewpoint that is shared by many. Um, the viewpoint that lawyers, either solicitors or barristers, should withdraw their services, um, I think maybe intersects more generally with the obligations that lawyers are under if they do undertake certain services. And that's really where bar councils and law associations can give a lot of guidance. Because if you are representing certain sorts of clients, um, then there are absolutely, in my view, very bright rules about the way in which it is ethical to represent those clients. And so there is an obligation in terms of one's ethical obligation to the court not to put forward certain sorts of arguments that maybe clients would wish you to put forward, not to question the science, not to push in certain ways that we know are antithetical to uh, 1.5 degrees and, therefore, and thereby antithetical to the livelihoods and lives of many human beings on the planet. And I think that it's squaring that circle that is the key difficulty that we face about how to ensure that whoever one is representing, one is always doing so in a way that is properly climate aligned. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm going to give my other two speakers a chance to say a last word as well. Um, I, yeah, Lungusani, you came off video, but you, you're still on screen. If you want to come in for a last, last comment and then, and then John briefly. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I agree. I mean, um, uh, the sentiments that have been expressed by my previous uh, uh, panelists are, are valid. And um, the, the, the point is that um, this is a turning point that uh, we're already giving uh, visibility and um, attention to what um, the bars, uh, bar associations can do in this important agenda is a starting point. I, I would, uh, as one of the uh, practical steps, um, I, I, I want to pro, um, promote, uh, well, encourage the promotion of closer collaborations um, between bar associations, first of all, among themselves, so as to lift everyone. No bar associations must be left. We all have different, you know, we're at different levels. 
but a deliberate effort to pull each other along in this important agenda is one practical way we can uh, improve the efficiency of the uh, uh, contribution of the legal profession as a whole in the uh, climate agenda. Uh, uh, ad additionally, there must be um, deliberate steps to strengthen the collaboration between bar associations and uh, research institutions and other, and other stakeholders because uh, the effectiveness of the legal profession uh, will is tied into how we also integrate the many great things that are done by research institutions, um, universities that are researching in these areas so that we transmit the information which has been researched into our legal practice. So I think one of the issues that I believe would be very effective in improving um, uh, how the legal profession and bars especially contribute to climate agenda is on those two fronts. Close that deliberate corporations are uh, bilateral as well as matrat on this important issue, as well as uh, uh, closer collaborations with research institutions and universities that are researching on um, our climate change agenda. I thought I should place those. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Lungasani's points are more or less the points that I was going to make, <laughs> um, and 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 they were well said. Uh, so what I would I would simply add as a way of pulling that together in a different way is simply to say one we as law associations as bar associations we need to learn from each other there are things that different law associations are doing uh, that we in the U.S. at the American Bar Association were unaware of that we can we can use and uh, benefit from and I think that kind of information sharing is is incredibly helpful the other thing that I would add about collaboration is to think about what ends toward which that collaboration might be addressed, uh, and and how how and the, the the big the big big question I think we all need to be thinking about, given that the the need to accelerate the transition is what can we do as law associations learning from each other. Uh, to to accelerate that transition in the trenches, the offices where day to day lawyers from all over the world are doing all kinds of different things for all kinds of different clients. I'll just stop with that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Um, maybe a challenge for everyone and all the all the different bar associations represented here. Can we come back next year with a model guidance for bar associations? I, I will look forward to chairing that uh, panel next year, and I will allow you to collaborate intensely for the next uh, 10 months to come up with that model that then everyone can adopt. Yeah. I can I just gonna... say, Stephen, can we, yes. can we make sure that everybody stays in touch with one another and yes. shares good practice, shares the model, um, and uh, I accept your challenge. Brilliant, Estelle. I am just going to hand over to Nina to close and have the last word. Thank you very much to everyone. Uh, thank you, Stephen. And for that, that gauntlet being thrown down, we are on it. I've got Laura from the IBA here. She is up, actively going up and, and ready to take that up. So yes, we are, we are going to do that. Um, thank you so much to our three um, amazing, amazing um, speakers. Thank you so, so much. I'm going to be very quick. Estelle, be mindful of role. Yes, absolutely. Lungasani, escalate the conversation. I'm going to start dropping that in to every conversation I have now about this. I love that concept. And John, the value of collaborative action. And with Stephen's challenge to all of us um, to meet back next year with concrete achievements um, at COP28, let's take that up, go with the collaborative action and, and see where we get to um, in this uh, very, very important work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen, for being a stellar co-host and, and Marie Claire and the um, Climate Law and Governments uh, team uh, for organizing this. And I think we're off to the next um, final closing plenary session. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>